um, um, half of a data visualization, data journalism outfit called Kiln. The other half is Duncan Park, who's in France at the moment. Um, so, I mean, uh, we, Duncan's a journalist by background, I'm a techie, and um, we set this thing up a couple of years ago to kind of combine those two worlds and to do online interactive data visualization, interactive storytelling, that kind of thing. Um, and we really like making maps. We've made a lot of maps in the time we've been doing this. I talked about one of them at GeoMob a couple of years ago. I'm going to talk about another one today, but um, a little bit of self-promotion. That's our website, that's our Twitter. Um, so this is the first map that we made. It's an interactive animated cartogram. This is the thing that I talked about um, in 2012. It's, um, can, you, you can, can you still hear me if I kind of come out here and wave my arms about it? I don't think so. Hover by the microphone like this. <laughs> Good, okay, great. Right. Um, so this is actually the unreleased 2014 remix. So this is a very kind of cutting edge version that you're seeing. Yes, that's something exciting to look forward to. Um, it's a bit more, anyway. I won't, I won't spoil the surprise when it comes out. Um, but, that, but, but this is, you can click on those different things up there, and, and the map sort of squishes around. It's a, it's a, a continuous area of cartogram. Um, and, so, and, and also, if you press play, it will kind of talk you through the whole story of carbon emissions and um, carbon reserves and all those other things you can see listed across the top. Um, and then we've done lots of other maps. You would have noticed. Um, in the switch there, that the, that the map switched from the Robinson projection to Eckert 4. This is kind of quite exciting to be talking to an audience where I can say that and not be joking. <laughs> um, so this is, this is another thing we did on Simon Lines, and then we've um, kind of done various maps. That's another one, showing all the gold mines in the world. This is kind of interesting, it's a sort of non-geographic map, a bit experimental. Um, it's done for open corporates who have collected data on we're trying to kind of collect data from all the companies in the world and how they're related to each other. Um, and this is Goldman Sachs. This is Goldman Sachs. Every each tiny little circle here um, is a company, um, and a line indicates an ownership relationship between the companies. So where one company owns another company, um, and we kind of pack them together into regions that, um, or into the into the um, borders of the countries that the companies are registered in. So unsurprisingly, they've got a lot of um, American companies. The headquarters is there, obviously, which spreads out across the world. Britain's fairly big. Does anyone recognize this one? Cyprus? Yeah. Good, yeah. yes. It's, the, yeah, it's around Cayman. It's the Cayman Islands. <laughs> Cayman Islands are a really good in the world of gold so. Um, so, so this is, um, and it's interactive. If you go to the thing, you can kind of hover over the little circles and it will show you what company is and where it's registered and what it's called and its ownership structure and they've recently added some more companies to it because originally a bunch of investment banks. Um, I've totally lost track of what time I started, so I don't know how long I've got. What time did I start? Five minutes ago, okay, fine. Um, this is another map of the world. This is what it looks like. Um, so this is the basis for a thing that we did a couple of months ago for The Guardian about the First World War. This is the kind of the background map, and obviously it doesn't really fit on the slides. It's a kind of big enormous thing that you can zoom in on. It's this very kind of textured, inky black and white map that we've overlaid, lots of kind of overlays on showing information about the First World War. Um, that's another map showing all the big cities in the world. That's another map. That's another map. <laughs> um, this is the one I really want to talk about. This is something that um, came out in January. Um, we were commissioned to make it by The Guardian, um, and it was marking the centenary of the first commercial flight. So the first commercial flight took off in Tampa Bay, Florida, on the 1st of January, 1914. Um, it was a little boat held one passenger, I think, um, a little kind of um, air boat that just flew a few feet above the water, made a Bamboo, I think. Um, the chap who flew it died a few months later, training pilots in Russia, the way that all pilots died quite quickly in those days. 
Um, and, uh, and that was the first time that anyone had thought to kind of charge people money for transporting them by aeroplane, um, which obviously is something that became more of a kind of feature of everyday life over the ensuing century. Um, so, if the gods are on my side, I'm going to show you. No, that's not, oh, that's not the right one. This is the right one. Um, it's the beginning of this. Now, it's mostly local. There's a little. Anyway, it's worked. I don't have to put the microphone close to it and turn it up loud. Okay, that's better. Okay, so that's the first one. Yeah, that's the first one. As you watch this, half a million human beings are in the sky, many of them high above the clouds in the thin air of the lower stratosphere. Here's where they are at this moment. The thousands of planes that crisscross the world simultaneously. And here's how they moved across the skies in the last 24 hours, based on live data that even takes account of delays to individual flights. Each day sees a similar global dance. As the sun rises on each region, so the takeoffs and landings begin. In Asia, then Europe, then America, then Asia once again. Only at the dead of night, the sky is clear a little. Plotting all the routes flown in a single day reveals the interconnectedness of the modern world and the uneven distribution of those connections. There are dead sweats above Europe, the US, and East Asia. But the skies are much emptier over Africa and South America. Explore the map and then press continue to see how we got to here. So I mean that's the kind of um, you know the first thing you see when you when you come onto this project and we the idea was that this would be something kind of visually impressive and exciting that would just evoke some curiosity about this strange business that's going on above our heads all the time of people hurtling through the sky in big metal tubes. To try to just summon up some curiosity about that to um, give you an incentive to, to want to know how it happened, which is what chapters two and three are about. Um, and then chapter four is obviously more about um, more about kind of where we go from here, what the, what the future is, holds or may hold. For aviation. How much time have I got? Five or six more minutes. So that's what I said there. Yeah, okay, so just um, a little bit, if I've got a few minutes then, about um, kind of how we, uh, what was involved in, in putting it together, because it was, a, it was a very fun project to work on. Um, but it was, as you can probably imagine, more complicated than it looked. And it probably looks quite complicated. Um, so three things, where to draw the planes, how to draw them, and then making a map to draw them on. Um, so where to draw the planes? We, we couldn't find any decent kind of open data source of, of flight schedules. Um, we, found, we found flight positions are easy. So, I'm not going to get too geeky about this because I haven't got that much time. But um, uh, so the, there is data available about exactly where in the sky aeroplanes are now, but it's very spotty because it relies on aviation enthusiasts installing ADSB transponders and connecting them to the internet. Um, and there aren't very many aviation enthusiasts in the middle of the Atlantic, for example. Um, and there aren't very many in kind of Central Africa. Um, so the data is very spotty, so we had to use um, scheduled data, so we knew where the plane took off and when, and where it landed and when, and we had to kind of guess where it was in between, so we just did a, an interpolation along the great circle um, to, to estimate the position of the plane in between. Um, and we did a deal with a company called Flightstats, who have a, lot, who have a very comprehensive database of flight schedules. Um, that's updated kind of constantly, literally every few seconds. We've got a mirror of their database running that pulls from their API, and it's updated every, every 30 seconds or so. Um, so it's very kind of up-to-date information. Um, and then that is 
crunched into a big data file with the interpolated positions of the planes at 50 minute intervals in a very compressed format so it doesn't crash your computer when you try to download it, like the first version did. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, it's available, it's available to the application. And it's, it's then drawn using 2D canvas um, in a, as you can probably imagine, kind of really brutally optimized way to make it work as well as it does, which is not always brilliantly really well. Um, then the, uh, yeah, the read map is just my fault. Um, so the, the map that it's drawn on, um, is um, was, I mean, just um, made in very much the ordinary way, really. It's a, it's a tiled map that is rendered using leaflet, and it's um, we use the shuffle radar topology emission data to you know create the, the textured relief shading, and then we used. Tile mill to, uh, to, uh, to pull it all together, which is not how I would do it now, but it worked fine. Um, and, and then we used something that we've used in a lot of our projects, which is a, an open source library that we developed called Talkie, which allows you to record a voiceover and synchronize things in sort of. Um, animations on the website to the voiceover. Um, so, so we see, you, know, you saw the first chapter there, you saw the, the voiceover and the, um, the, the synchronized animations. The thing, what maybe wasn't totally clear from what you saw, is that this is a fully interactive map. It's not, uh, you know, it's not just um, something that you sit back and watch. It's not just an animation, it's, a, it's an interactive thing you can, Move the time around, change the things around, and then turn these little sunrise, or well not sunrise, like you know, time markers on and off, and you can make the planes fly like that. Um, so, I think that's probably all I've got time to show you in detail. Um, if you're interested, you can look it up if you Google. Guardian in flight, I think you'll find it. Um, or if you go to kiln.it slash project slash in flight, that will redirect you to it. Um, obviously there's a link on our website. Probably the easiest way is to go to our website and find the link, actually. Just go to kiln.it and find the link. That's the best way. Um,